welcome to So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. Are you evaluating your career in real estate? Feel like you're ready for a fresh start or ready to take your career to the next level? This is your podcast. Welcome back to So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. Alicia just said something really funny right before we started recording. So you're getting us laughing as we start. This is a live show. I'm Meredith Fogel, along with my co-host, Alicia Soikawa. So today we are talking about the truth about managing a team. And I'm making it probably sound more dramatic than it really is, although there can be lots of drama around managing a team. Uh, So we're going to tell you our thoughts on managing a team. And I think it's kind of interesting because some agents, many, I think, feel like that's kind of like the epitome of the real estate career is like you go from being a solo agent, maybe you are even a mentee or an assistant or an apprentice, and then you grow into being like your full-fledged solo agent. And then if you're following something like, um, you know, millionaire real estate agent, you're bringing on an assistant, buyer's agents, listing agent specialists, you're got, you've got your admin staff all in place and you've got this, this team, which then can become like a mega team. And some people think like that is the be all and end all of the real estate career. And then they get to the peak and they go, what am I doing here? And also where are my profits? And I'm bleeding money. And oh my gosh, now I've got to disassemble this whole thing. So we want to kind of talk to you about the truth of it. And I think both of us have been in both of these places. We've been solo agents. We've been starting out in our careers. We've managed large teams. We've made transitions from large teams to smaller teams, back to larger teams again. So we've got lots of information to share. And I think right now, Alicia, I don't know if you agree with this. It seems like the um, that kind of like gold standard of trying to get to being like a mega team leader has, I think like the, the shine is off that. What's the word? The bloom is off that rose a little bit. I feel like it's people aren't feeling like that is really the path so much anymore. Why do you think that is? I think because we're shifting in markets with the NAR settlement, number one has changed the game for buyers and buyers agents and also has changed the game with the commission conversation. Number one, number two, uh, the interest rates raising so fast, so quickly coming off of a huge flood of um, so much opportunity, I think, in general, where team leads could easily, you know, just place people into buyer agent roles and place them into, you know, online leads and get them to convert um, and make money off of each person, like a machine, like a, like a factory. Mm. I think it's going away from a factory, like in and out, in and out transaction to actually scale level. Um, the gravitas, the understanding of the nuances of personalities and relationships and how to have difficult conversations and getting people um, problem problem solving in the real estate realm is very touch and go and very um, each home specific. It's very unique to the property you're selling, whatever you're selling. It's not a like, you know, this is how you do it. And it works like this every time. It's not like short order cook anymore. And I think if for a while there, it was, because it was literally, that's why the new um, agents and no shade to them, because many of them have shifted beautifully and are learning and cutting their teeth and growing, which is amazing to see. But there were a lot of them that came in in that 2020 to 2023 time period that all they knew was write the highest offer you can write, wave as many things as you can wave, and you'll get an offer accepted and you'll win. That was literally their play. With never everything. went on a home inspection, never knew. Never had to negotiate work. anything, never had yes. to deal with appraisal contingencies because the person waived it. Right. Never had to. And then everybody was just, it was just like, um, again, short order cook. So, and I think if you were a mega team and you had 50 of these types of agents on and you were able to pay all the, for all the leads online or lead flow, you were converting, you know, and you were making your agents happy and you weren't getting happy. So there was that huge like windfall at time period. Was it easy? No, I'm sure they had a lot of turnover and training and things that had to be done and a lot of money up front for advertising. But overall, I think because the machine was oiled and it was going, whether they were spending a hundred thousand a month or whatever on leads, they were probably making 200. Does that make sense? So I think that it was working at that time period, but as soon as we saw the rates go from what, three, four, five now, you know, to seven, eight, 
it was almost like the brakes were slammed on. Yeah. And then no more buyers, no more, you know, I know a lot of mortgage lenders that had switched and changed their company, you know, situations closed. So many. Yeah. There's just the money drained. And, and a lot of people are running really like they're living large in the sense that they have these very large overheads and they don't, they are planning for not anything ever happening. Right. And agents are notorious for being fat cats in the sense of yay, champagne. And then, oh no. Mm-hmm. They don't do anything. Like they're very reactionary, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Not right. no, hey, no, let's no. let's let's save money for when this is gonna happen. Right. Let's anticipate that this is not always gonna be like this. So right. right. But you remember why. it was interesting during that that kind of boom period, Tom Ferry said to us, save your money, save your money, save your money, save your money. I want you all to have four million dollars in the bank. And we all looked at each other like, you know, what why? We're all like riding high on all this. This is never gonna end. And guess what? It ended. And the people that did not save learned a really hard lesson. And interestingly, I think I, I hear what you're saying about the um, the skill set of agents needing to shift so rapidly. And I think what what happened a lot of the time was you're right. They were like the short order cook, and now they have to be a gourmet chef all of a sudden. They didn't go to culinary school. They have no idea how to even put ingredients together, and they can only make one thing, and they don't make it very well most of the time. And all of a sudden, they've got to be able to service clients with a whole different level of needs. And they've got to be able to lead generate too, because the lead flow really started to scale back. And many of them just really floundered. And then we had these team leaders who I think were going in two directions. One was either, oh my gosh, I have failed my team, right? Like it feels like I haven't taught people what they really need to know to succeed in this business, but they had no time. All they were doing was people collecting and managing at a pretty high level, maybe Mm -hmm. doing some like KPI analysis and feedback. And that was kind of it. Um, And others that looked at what, where they had become, what they had become, where their trajectory was and not liking who they had become anymore as this leader of a mega team. I think that's such an interesting piece too. I was on a, a call, a mastermind with, a bunch of agents, one who was a uh, team leader of a, a Zillow team, a mega Zillow team, and really questioning whether to continue that path or whether to scale completely back and have either a SEAL team or even go solo. And one of the other team leaders on the call said to this agent, do you like who you've become? And it was such a great question. So I think that's something to think about before you even take a dip a toe into beginning to form a team, have a clear vision of who you want to be first. Is that who you want to be? Do you want to be somebody who's more of a, a, um, a mentor to a smaller group? Do you like the idea of developing people? Or maybe you do. Maybe you want to be like a CEO of a giant organization. And that's totally cool too. But Envision it first. Don't let the train just pull you along. Do it intentionally. And I think what's great is those of us who had built to that kind of giant team level and learned a lesson about who we were once we got there now have a chance to do that. 100%, sister. Like, I hate to say it. There is a place most people that go into real estate are sales driven. We're all sales people. Yeah. And salespeople are driven by performance. They're achievement-based. And most sales agents and leaders are strong DI personality, meaning dominant driver and super outgoing, typically. Sometimes you don't see that, but I'm going to just say in general. And what I see happening from people I coach and just ecosystem people and friends is that everybody wants their name in lights. Yeah. Everybody wants their name on the banner. Everybody wants, just like the question, we had a conversation earlier about, people asking you how you got to be a keynote and this and that. And I'm like, mm-hmm, cause she worked her butt off. But anyways, that's another question, but um, it's the concept of, I want that. Yeah. I want what they have. Just like on Instagram, you see what someone has on Instagram. And you're like, I want their life. You have no idea about what their life's about. Right. At all, but you want their life and you think you deserve to be that person. So I think agents coming in, it's great. And it's a double-edged sword. It's wonderful because it shows people what can be. If this is what you want, you can get it. Like, it's so cool. Cause a lot of times you don't know what it is until you see it. So it's great for those people that are like, I want that. I see that I want it. 
if you want it for the wrong reasons, that's where I think it bites you. And so in all honesty, I think I wanted to grow a brokerage and do all these things um, because I thought I was supposed to. I thought that was the next step. It's kind of like a version when you're younger and you're dating someone and you're like, oh, we got married because you're supposed to get married. Right. Not (laughs) a lot of people go through that. And then you see later on when they get divorced, you just realize you just were taking the next step without thinking about it because that was the next step. And so in our minds that we haven't given ourselves permissions to have a business, how we design it, but no one ever said you needed to have a team and no one ever said you needed to have a brokerage or have all these people working with you or sell hundreds of houses. The whole point of going into business for yourself is to carve out a space that fits you and your life and your family and what you want. That's the whole purpose. Mm -hmm. However, salespeople more than a typical like pizza place or a coffee shop are all about, I, I got to win. Mm-hmm. I want to be number one. And then they're seeing these people with these mega teams putting out these crazy numbers and you automatically is, assign that as better. So that's in your mind going, that's what I have to have. That's the honest truth. And that's exactly what happens to 99% of people. Because a lot of times I get onto an onboarding call and they tell me preface right up front, I don't want a team. I don't mm-hmm. want you to make a team. I don't want a team. Huh. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to force you. Isn't that funny? So the perception is there that that's what they're supposed to do. Still, that's like lingering in people's minds. And I think you're exactly right. It's you see it and it looks like the gold standard. And then you don't understand what really lies behind the surface. I think the other thing that happens a lot is because, like you said, usually team leaders are great salespeople. And what are great salespeople not usually great at? financial management a lot of the time. So the financial piece is kind of either completely ignored or it's neglected for a very long period of time. And that's when we see that the team becomes less than profitable and sometimes bleeding money because the agent, the the team lead is so uh, focused on production, achievement, success, and not ever, and, and measuring that in units and volume in GCI without actually measuring any costs and expenses for running the team as it gets more and more bloated. Um, that's a, another piece that can be a real, a real danger point. So what if, if someone comes to you and says the opposite of that says, Alicia, I really want to want to be a team one day. I want to lead a team one day. What questions would you ask, or would you say our audience should ask themselves that might help them evaluate whether leading a team makes sense for them? So first of all, there are three things you're going to be. You're going to be an artist, a manager, leader, or an entrepreneur. You fit into one of those three categories in your nature. Mm. So this is what I learned at Business Mastery with mm. Tony Robbins. Okay. And I had to have a hard conversation. He's like, he even claimed himself, my nature is to be the talent. That's what he said, is, is an artist. Of himself. He, he's like, I'm an artist by nature. Okay. I will, I am a leader and a manager because I have to be, but it's not my nature. Mm. And I can do entrepreneurial things, but I'm not into that. So an entrepreneur is someone that is able to withstand incredible high risk Mm. and actually leans towards it. They are the early, (laughs) such early adopters that, um, like someone like, remember when Tesla first came out and there were people that bought it, you didn't even know what it was. That's an early adopter. Okay. Someone that launches, like, you know, I think I'm an early adopter launching the state, right? But I'm not because Nazar was opening the whole company. That's an entrepreneur of mine. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's fucking ballsy. Like, that's a high level of risk that he's. It's a huge risk. Michael, my husband, Michael, is an entrepreneur at heart. Mm. They all start very scatterbrained. And very like, oh, we got to do this. And they see it. They already see it, all the things that can fit. And you're like, that's stupid. He was the one that came to me with Bitcoin in 1997. Wow. And we so could have bought it. Is a visionary or is it different from a visionary? It is a similar, it's a version of a visionary, but different. It's an entrepreneur. It's your nature. You're one mm-hmm. of the three. So you can be a visionary and an artist. Mm-hmm. So I'm an artist. You're the talent. I'm out there. Um, people want to work with me because of me. People want to coach with me because of me. I'm the talent. I'm, and I love it. I love the talent. I love it. I'm in it. I'm doing all the things. I love working with my clients. I'm the artist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I hate managing. I detest it with all parts of my being. 
But I kept telling myself, oh, you got to do this yeah. and I will learn it and I will learn to lead. And I'm like, I hate it. Now I will be a manager and leader. Like I manage my, our expenses. I look at the P&L. I'll lead the things I need to lead and do the things I need to do, but it's not my nature. Mm. So if it's not your nature. What happens is you tend to avoid hard conversations. Mm. You don't want to hold accountability to people because you're an, I'm an artist. I want to have fun. I don't want to be the one that's going there and telling them they have to turn their stuff in. It's too, it's not fun. Okay. okay. Do you see what I'm saying? I do. Okay. So there's the artist, the entrepreneur, and what's the other one? The middle one is manager leader. The one that we both manager leader. The one that I'm somehow Freudianly taking out of my brain here, apparently. So, okay. But could you be a, an artist or an entrepreneur and hate management? Yeah. That's okay. exactly so what I am. Team. You could still, but you could still be lead a team. You can or build still it. build it. You just have to recognize you hate it and you probably suck at it. So you need to find the manager to right. do it for you. Okay. So having that like eyes wide open approach mm-hmm. about who you are and what you need to supplement your nature is incredibly important if you want to build a team that is successful and that leads to fulfillment for you as a Correct. person. Okay. Because you, you're looking at, if you're building a team, you're legit building a true company. Yeah. Like don't go into building a team like, I'm just going to wing it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's the surprising number of people that still use their personal account to get commission checks is shocking to me, you Gosh. know? Right. Um, but it's a lot. And there are people that don't even know what a PL means. Yeah. Like they're just yeah, get, they get a check, they use what they need to use and they move on with their life. And at the end of the year, when taxes come around, they're in big trouble. Okay. And, so that leads me to another you know, question. Can you be financially incompetent or think you are and lead a team? People do it every day. If this you have the right country, person in your country is led by one. <laughs> if you have if you have the right person yes, in the answer place. is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay. So you have to plug somebody in to shore that shortfall up. I would. Well. Okay. If you don't know what you're if you don't have a money person that's that's reining the money in and saying this is what our budget is and this is what we need to do, you'll lose money so fast and you'll be out of business faster than you relieve. Hmm. Okay. All right. Now, if you have, let's say that you you have this vision for yourself, you have the goal of building a team, you recognize that you are either the artist or the entrepreneur, you get it that you have to plug people in to, to shore you up. From, from uh, management, how, forgetting management, because we hate it. Forgetting management, right. Well, we need, so the management person is in there. You've got a sales manager, you've got an, an ops person who's going to shore up your, your visionary or your artist or entrepreneurial character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how prepared do you have to be, even if you have those pieces in place for, what's the word I'm looking for, for preparing, I guess, for the shift that's going to happen? Because this is the other thing I see happen sometimes that people forget is as they're building the team, because remember, if they're the entrepreneur or the artist, they've been the rainmaker probably. Mm -hmm. So if they are now pivoting their focus to building and bringing people on under them, even putting the right foundational pieces in place, the rainmaker piece falls off sometimes. Correct. And then the team lead look, turns around and goes, oh my gosh, what happened to my pipeline? What happened to my business? How do we how do we manage that piece? You just have to not let it go. It's just like when you tell our agents that, you know, when you're a new agent and you get your first deal, what happens? They stop prospecting because they're babysitting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the J goes. No okay. All right, so, so you just put your focus in the right place. And so it, it, you, that's a non-negotiable. So if you're still in production and you're a team lead and you your production's mandatory to make the team survive, you got to get to a place where you need to be bringing on the right people that A players, not C players. Okay. Mm-hmm. A, a players love to be measured. They show they are going to bring you their report card. I got a straight A's mom. C players don't want to be measured. Right. Right. So that's how you figure out who needs to be on your team. And I figured that out real quickly this year. In the last couple of years. So I think for me, I am just done with having D, F players that yes. that were just sucking the life out of me. And that's what happens to a lot of team leaders. They don't recognize who talent is because they don't believe they deserve to have the good talent because they have that imposter syndrome. Like, why would they come with me? So and, true. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think also, if you happen to be the artist type, typically, you're also mm-hmm. very empathetic. So you're going to have a hard time once you've bonded with people saying goodbye to those people. And if you have any fear of rejection, whether you're doing the rejection, rejecting, or they're doing the leaving, you still feel abandoned and rejected. So there's that whole piece of it too. Managers, I feel have less 
of a problem with that. And therefore, it's a good idea to have somebody who's that middle person for you who can objectively look at performance and go, Alicia, Meredith, you thought that was an A player. They talked a really good game when they came in, and they do sometimes. And that person's actually a C. What's yeah. interesting about that, too, is what we know is A players, which are fewer and farther between, if you put them in a, a position of leadership, they bring on B players typically which is mm -hmm. fine. You can have a good, long, stable, a good, deep, stable of B players, but B players hire C players. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can't put B in management. You can sometimes coach B players up to A and you can put them in leadership or management, but the C's, the, you got to watch out for those C's. Now, when you say D and D and F players, what do you, how do you characterize those people? D and F players are ones that you know better, but you still keep them on for body count. A lot of team leaders think that it's the number of people you have on that matters. So they'll just keep people on for body count when they're not doing any business. They're actually a liability um, because they don't do that much business. So they don't know the contracts and what they're doing. Number one, they cause problems because they're disrespectful to team members or whatever. They may have personal issues that cause strife. They cause a lot of issues. They refuse to follow the rules, even though you've given them many warnings and they give you the sob story and you fall for it time and time again. That's the DF. It just And, and they may be incredible humans incredible humans. And that I'm not, this has nothing to do with who you are as a person. That's just who you are in business and in the business you're trying to run. Yeah, it's so true. And it's, and it's so hard to see that as a, as a leader, sometimes, like you said, if they're yeah. incredible humans, that they might also be dead weight that need to be cut. And what's really interesting is I have heard people look at like giant teams before, and sometimes the team, the, the number of team members is incredibly impressive. And you'll have somebody who's like a, an ancillary service or a real estate adjacent professional think about wanting to like invest, co-market, support in some way that team. And you know what they do? They look at and see what the total GCI for the whole team is and go, well, wait a second, that's only like a thousand dollars on average per team member. That is not a team I want to invest in. So be very careful when you're bringing on those people who end up being DNF to cut them because you're not building a profitable business or a business that's really scalable or even sellable at some point. And it's certainly not manageable long-term. No, because you think about it, if you have, if, let's just say you have 50 people and only two of them are really doing the business or two to five, those other people are draining resources. Right. And their liabilities and they're draining resources and they're setting bad examples. And the more you tolerate the bad examples, you're letting everybody else know on the team that you tolerate it. So you tolerate what you get in business and life and that's what you'll get. And so even with our own standards and our own disciplines and consistency we talked about is that if you tolerate it, that's what you get. Yep. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. Exactly. And I think that's the agents are watching. So like I had some attrition when I, now that I'm making this move and at first I was really upset and I thought about it and I said, I made a decision to let go of someone that needed to be, to just wasn't working anymore and it's for the best. And when I made that decision and I had my manager to handle it, cause I just didn't need to be in that conversation, you know, I had an exit interview and I just, I was like, laid it out. I was like, you have no self-awareness. And he, he was like, wow, I know that, but it was hard to hear that. I'm like, you need to go figure it out. Like, I'm not, I can't be your mom. Like you're older than me. Like, this is ridiculous, you know? And I adore this person, but it just didn't make sense anymore, you know? And in result of that, two others decided to not come along. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is horrible. And then I thought, this is amazing <laughs> because they are, they are brave enough to say, this isn't for me. Yeah. That's okay. Like, right. You got to know it could, because I've said this is who I am and this is what I want to attract. Now, who's for me is going to come and who's not for me is not going to come. Exactly. Right. Where I was saying, please, everybody come. Mm -hmm. You can't be the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> no, we are not Ellis Island. Yeah. All right. So, let's we've given some ugly truths about teams. What are some like positive truths about teams? What have you seen that's worked when people have good, well, high functioning teams? I've seen amazing growth in people, yeah. um, almost like a creating of a circle of a container ship, I guess, mm. of supportiveness, yeah. helping people go through things in personal life and, you know, people showing up for each other, like seeing people train together and teach someone, like someone might have a strength in social and someone might have a strength in, in sales yeah. scripts. 
Yes. Um, sharing is beautiful. Um, working together, and not against each other. Covering each other on vacations, yes. understanding like things like that, like holiday parties. Um, just that kind, of, like the the camaraderie ship, because it's a very lonely business that we're in. So to grow a team, it does create that family feeling of work work family, and it's beautiful to see it blossom in the right spaces. Right. Um, and you have a really good leader that understands and. Um, leaders also like understanding, like, you know, setting ground lines, like, and then understanding like they're working in their highest, best use of time and not, you know, always cranking, but having other people and seeing them shine. Like the, I I will say this the first time an agent outperforms the team lead is, is very exciting. That's the goal. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think another piece of that is where I've seen team leaders allow an agent to grow their own wings and like fly the nest. That's yeah. pretty spectacular too. Never burning a bridge, keeping the door open in case that agent ever wants to come back home again. But the pride that can come when you have helped an agent develop their own skill set to such a point that they're able to leave you. Yeah. Like having a kid and the kid goes and is able to live independently. That's that's kind of the point. So when you have a, a culture, I think that's what kind of we were describing before we use that word. It's sort of a sort of a, a piece of real estate jargon, but culture is that kind of container ship that you talked about. And it looks different, I think, on every single team. Um, um, and when you have a culture that's strong enough, sometimes even those top producing agents are the ones who have fully fledged, will not leave the nest because they are able to come back and give their skill set to others and help others build as well when they're really aligned. But sometimes yes. you fly. And that's beautiful too. And sometimes they come back yeah, again. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. So there are lots of good ways to do it as well. And just like everything else in real estate, there are lots of ways to succeed as a team. You can yeah. be a two-person team. You can be a, what we call a SEAL team, a very small team with maybe like a one or two admin. You can be a medium-sized team. And there's, I think there's this, I'm going to call it a myth of this mid-sized team. It was like between 11 and 22 people that was always considered like team purgatory. And you can't really, you're not really small. You're not really big. You can't really get traction. I'm going to disagree with that because that's kind of where I sit right now. And I think you have the right pieces in place and the right people in place. It's a very comfortable place to be with the A players, with the right players. Yes. And I think, I think A players, if you have the right players, no matter what size team you have, you're going to win. Yes. Yes. Totally agree. All right, so to kind of wrap up this, this episode, knowing what you've gone through as a team lead and as a, a broker owner at this point and knowing what, what you know about me and the people that we interact with daily, if you had um, like three questions for people who are thinking about should they start a team or should they stay leading the team that they're currently leading, what would those three questions be? Um, first of all, I would say, what is your money situation look like? Number one. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Um, no, I'm trying to understand, do they understand their money? Like, yep. where does it come from? What is their, uh, expenses versus their net income? Do they have allocations for rainy days and, you know, those kinds of things, how much are they depending on their personal production and do they have a, a, a fully functioning assistant that can replace them? Okay. Love it. Like, you know, do you, like they have to be like able to support the team yep. because if they don't have the right admin already in place when they're growing this team, they will be the admin and they will be training the admin plus answering all the 50 questions that come a day. Right. So they've got to be able to step away and be not a, a totally ingrained operator every single day. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like starting over again as a solo agent because what yeah. you've done is you've magnified yourself as a solo agent times however many agents you have. And you're their person. Yes. And if you really want to do it right, and you're saying you want to do it right and grow the right way, then you need to be able to filter through where, how are you going to answer questions? Are you going to have time to meet with people, advise them? It's a lot of time. Oh, and if you're still trying to fit in showings and your own prospecting and heaven forbid you have a personal life, right. you're just taking on a whole nother, you've just like multiplied your your time spent working and cranking by however many agents you have. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And I don't think people realize that it's not all glamorous. I think people think, oh, I'll just bring some agents on and give them the things and they'll sell it and I'll get some money. It's not a referral. That's different. I don't know. Totally. Yeah. Different. Yeah. yeah. All right. What's the second question people should ask themselves? Um, money is the first. Second would be what 
what are you wanting to build? Kind of like what we talked about with the YouTube episode is what does that team look like? Do you have like understanding your the tree of what you're building? I think Lisa Chinade shared her organizational mm-hmm. charts. What does yeah. that chart look like? What does it look like one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Great question. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and are one? you right? And then also in that chart to making sure you have enough admin to support the agent count. So you cannot have one lonely assistant supporting 25 people. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. The admin. That's not fair. So That's important. not fair. Absolutely. Now, let, me, let me ask you this, and this is a little bit of a, a tangent. I know we're almost at time, but the, is it important to put those admin pieces in place or support pieces in place before you build the team? Or can you do it as you go? I would say that's the first thing that needs to be in place. Okay. So if yeah. you're a solo agent, and I think we both agree on that. If you're a solo agent, that's doing a ton of business, like 50 deals, at least even mm-hmm. 25 deals, 30 deals, and you're making money, you need an assistant to be taking those low dollar items off your plate first yeah. and foremost. Like they should, you should not be doing that. So that person then can help articulate what your checklists are, which is what we call SOPs. SOPs are just checklists. Yeah. What are your checklists to fly, right? What are yeah. your checklists to get a listing up, to get a buyer up, to work with people, client appreciation, follow up? How do we handle these things? Mm-hmm. If you are doing that winging it and then you're going to bring agents on they're winging it and then you're going to bring an assistant on like Sorry. i can just say right now like that didn't even make any sense no it doesn't work that is an exercise in futility and will really frustrate you as a team like, lead it'll be yeah, like making a restaurant without a chef <laughs> so true just cooking so true. like yep. you know yeah weird all right so your three questions do you do you have a good handle on your finances do what does it look do? like and then, what, is, what are you building, right? And then do you have the admin support in place? And if you don't, stop, drop, and reevaluate what you're doing and then put one of those pieces in place. But that, that's part of it. Like if you say you want this team, yep. first half is do you have enough business to warrant having an assistant? If you don't and you want a team, great. Well, get your business, get your own skill level up to make enough yep. business to yep. support you and your assistant first, right? Then let that assistant let you double what you can do. Right. And then you start adding a buyer's agent to take away your buyer pool. Yep. Right. And they can't help you with some of the listings and showings and then teach them how to fish. Yep. And then that buyer agent may have a friend and they bring it. This, it just happens like that. You can't, I don't think it can be like bring on 25 people at once. That's mm-hmm. not how it works. Yeah. No, that doesn't work. Yeah. At some point you could get to that once you become a real owner and then you can acquire other teams if you've got your skill set and yeah. all your foundational people. Place, yeah, but yeah, that takes a lot of growth. All right. Well, hopefully so this was helpful. I think that was a really good summary, Alicia, at the end there of the steps to kind of consider before you even think about building a team. If you have questions for us, we are both teams coaches, so we can help you evaluate whether a team is right for you, um, answer questions and tell you about coaching that's available to you. Because I think that's one of the other kind of like cherry on the top secrets is that people who operate teams at a high level are almost always coached. They have to be for mindset, for skills, for introduction to other tools and resources that they wouldn't have exposure to otherwise, and to keep their teams functioning at a high level. Because you know what? The coach doesn't just coach the team leader. The coach coaches the team. Correct. All right. Good stuff. Thank you, Alicia. This has been So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. We will see you next time. We are so grateful you have joined us today. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe to our show or share it with people that you think would benefit. And please remember to leave us a review or rating on the platform on which you are listening. And if you've got questions about Tom Perry coaching, have the both of us here, please contact us directly. We would love to answer your questions or if you're just curious, we'd love to have a conversation. You can reach us at any of our social media outlets or shoot us a direct message.